So I wanted to be a uh, glorified consumer of these talks, but Drew had another idea. So here I am presenting what I'm doing and um, wanted to share a little story about myself, not because I want to self-promote, but I think it's important to know how we got to do what we're doing. So when I was 18, I watched this documentary about uh, the sewage system in London. And the documentary claimed that the engineers that designed that system probably saved more lives from uh, uh, waterborne diseases than any doctor in London ever did. So I think the same statement begs to be made uh, by data scientists. And I think now it's the time to start looking at healthcare data differently. Okay, so I work for Rocky Mountain Analytical here in Calgary, and it's a functional medicine lab. Functional medicine is uh, different from conventional medicine or traditional medicine in a sense that it looks at um, the holistic health of a patient. So rather than looking at one compound at a time or one symptom at a time, uh, trying to approach uh, the patient as a whole. Rocky Mountain Analytical is part of Life Labs. And Life Labs is for uh, Ontario and BC, what Calgary Lab Services um, is for us. Uh, so if you were to do blood work, chances are, in Ontario or BC, chances are it'll go uh, through Life Labs. And uh, it's growing and expanding. So uh, the functional medicine branch is here in Calgary. Uh, and it's also growing in Manitoba and uh, Saskatchewan. Okay, every bit counts, pun intended. So bit is like the measure of data. So we don't want to lose anything from a patient. Every piece of information can be very va valuable. And my work uh, pertains specifically to omics. And omics is a discipline of biology that deals with a lot of data. Uh, and ideally, it would be functional data, so data that has a function, that has a meaning. Whether we know it or not, that's another story, but uh, so far, we have a good um, understanding of a, a lot of genes, a lot of proteins, and a lot of metabolites function. So the dogma or the general uh, biological pipeline in each and every cell, cell is that at the nucleus level, we have our DNA that gets translated into proteins. And those proteins, once they're expressed, they produce metabolites. That's a very simplistic way of looking at things. This is no longer true. This is how I was introduced to biology. It is no longer true. DNA can be repressed by methylation. RNA can have functions. It is changing, but let, for simplicity's sake, let's uh, stick with this uh, frame of thinking just because we've been used to it for the last 50 years. Now enters the area of exposomics, though I won't talk about this a lot. And they're, they're, having, uh, they're complaining from symptoms. It could be that their testosterone is okay, but they're converting all of it to estrogens with all the rest that could Pose notably for, for men, uh, high estrogens can cause uh, prostate cancer. Okay? So, a long introduction to the idea that we're not only one thing at a time, we're a complex set of parameters playing with each other. And where AI comes uh, to solve this problem is when we look at data um, from uh, the genome, gene expression data, okay? So I'll get, last time when White Analytics presented here, uh, people asked for a, a, a demo of the software, uh, and I thought that that's a good idea, so I'll be, I'll be presenting a little demo of how we can use uh, machine learning algorithms. All right, so um, 
DNA microarray is a technique that has been out there for the last uh, 20 years. It is dying now, uh, giving way to full ge uh, genome sequencing because we're getting uh, better by the hour at that technique. Um, and the way it works is very, fairly simple. So we get a normal cell in a cancerous cell. And the, the um, and then we have like a microscope slide that is coated with DNA, okay? And we get the patient sample. Uh, the DNA from the patient will bind to the DNA that is on the slide, and it will light up depending on the expression of the gene. So if the gene is present in both healthy and cancerous cell, it will light up as yellow. So we're not really interested in that. If the gene is present uh, in normal cells only, um, then it lights up in green. And if it's present only in diseased cells, then it lights up in red. So that's, in a nutshell, what that DNA microarray is about. So our targets are really the, the, the genes that light up in red and that are unique to each and every disease. Remember, we had two types of disease, AML, and ALL, so we want to determine the, the, um, the, uh, the genes that are responsible and that are characteristic of uh, each and every disease, okay? But the problem is with uh, DNA microarray, we get 7,129 genes uh, that are specific to each disease. So gut reaction is, let's ditch this technique and look for something else. Maybe rely on the conventional, symptomatic, and clinical assessment of the patient, right? But since data techniques are uh, improving, then we can actually narrow down this diagnostic, okay? So I was, I was just curious, was the DNA microarray the same thing as TGH array? Sorry, can you say that again? Is, is the DNA microarray the same thing as TGH array? I'm not familiar with the second technique. Like, uh, compared to genomic characterization. No. It's like putting a, a patient uh, sample on a, on a chip, like a reference, and doing like fluorescent taking. Uh, the principle is the same, but I'm not familiar with the second technique, so I don't want to say something that I'll regret after. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. It's exactly the same principle. Yeah. Okay. So this is uh, a data set where that needs to be transposed first. So we have 72 patients. Some of them are training. Some of them are testing. Some do have the clinician diagnostic of being an ALL, and the others are, have the, cl the clinician diagnosis of being an NM NML. NAL. Okay. So the, all the genes are... Uh, here, there was 7,000 7, of them. So for simplicity's sake, I narrowed them down to 50 based on the initial step of narrowing down from 7,000 to 150 to 50. All right, so these are the 50 most contributing genes uh, in, in those two diseases. And it's not good enough for an accurate diagnostic. So. We initialize the case ID as a row identifier. The training or testing is considered not distributed, and our response variable would be the, the diagnostic of the clinician, okay? So running from there, just select all the continuous data, which is the levels of expression of each and every gene, and finish. All right, then See here, this is the response variable, so the, the final say of the disease. So we're trying to build the model. We're trying to teach the machine how to reg recognize that a patient is ALL or AML, okay? So, and we go learning. It's going to be a supervised learning because we know the result. Okay, let's, let's do the unsupervised first and see how the outcome looks like. There are several algorithms that are embedded into the software. The best one so far is the maximum spanning tree. And that's how it goes. So what this is telling us basically is that um, 
without even, te without even telling the software that the diagnostic is the response variable, it uses it as such because these genes are highly correlated to that response variable, okay? So there is like a, a hybrid semi-supervised approach where you start initially with no assumptions and let the data guide you in that process. So according to what I see here, I should trust the data and uh, use the, uh, the uh, clinical, clinician uh, diagnostic as a, um, a target for my model, okay? So I'm doing exactly the same thing here. I'll just let the video carry on, okay. All right, so, and then when we select all the, so each and every circle here is called a node, and it's linked um, with the coefficient and meaningfully uh, to, the, to the target. Well, in this case, we can't really say that it's a target, uh, but it's, it's, they're linked to the, to the central node, and they're linked also to, to each other. Uh, and the way that Bayesian networks uh, act, it's based on probabilities, okay? So for the response variable, which is ALL or AML, we only have two variables. For the gene expression, we decided that it will have three, uh, three bins or three containers for the response. Mind you that every gene has a, an expression level, okay? So that can be classified from 1 to 10, from 10 to 20, and from 20 to 30. Just random numbers, okay? So the idea is when we uh, decide to keep only those that were diagnosed with ALL, it shows you the variation in the level of genes that are attached to that disease, okay? So this was not 100% before we clicked on ALL 100%. Uh, I feel I'm not explaining this in the best of ways, so if you have any questions later on, I'll be more than happy to answer them. Same with AML. If we only focus on those that have AML, we'll find a certain level of expression. All right, so now we're going to do the, the supervised learning where we assign a target, so now you see this cell has like a target. And there are different algorithms that we can use to, uh, to assess. Some algorithms with the naive base, they'll use each and every information, they will not lose anything. Uh, but that's not uh, very useful to our purposes, which is uh, a very accurate diagnostic. And others would discriminate based on uh, how good uh, the correlations are, and it goes on and on. So re each step will come with a reduction of the number of genes that are most associated with the diseases, okay? Uh, the parameter that we need to be looking at is the one at the very bottom, that 5,200. So the lower that parameter is, the better the model, and there are other ways of assessing the model notably this one. So it shows you how many were expressed, um, uh, how many accurate uh, hits in your model are. So out of 47, there was six, 46 that were true and only one that was wrong. Any ideas to why that is? The hint is it has to do with the data. So you're building your model, you want your model to be 100% true. There is really no reason why, because you're telling the machine like what the information is. So the model should be 100% accurate. And uh, any ideas? Very close. It has to do with the content of the cells. So sometimes some models don't work when you have Yes, but in this case, we don't really have missing data. It's actually zeros. So for some reason, the gene did not get, it's a defect in the technique itself, that happens. 
So the way to adjust for that is to affect a very low value, which is 0 0.00001. Is that how you call it? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's too small. Mm -hmm. see? Yeah. So that's why it disappears. Yeah. Like making a description in your data. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's yeah. Like yeah, it's just because the algorithm does not function yeah. without having a certain value in there. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's the idea. So the way to remediate to that is to smooth your data, and this software uh, does provide that. It's actually a part of uh, the regular. So you just affect one, and you distribute it across all the missing data, which are like a million cells or even more than that. And then you relearn again with the, the algorithm that gave you the best estimate for your, uh, for your values, for, for your model, sorry. Okay. I think I was confused in here. Yeah, so the software has like a modeling interface and an anal analysis interface, so you cannot evaluate. See, now it's 47 and 25. So it's, the model is 100% accurate based on the data, and we can carry on and use it later on. Okay, cut a long story short here. Are we running out of time? So once I build the model over uh, from these 72 patients, I want to evaluate an unknown patient, okay? So if a patient comes and they need their diagnosis based on their microarray result, I should be able to tell them uh, what their disease is, okay? So for that, we use the so same, same process of loading. So the model is in the background right now, and um, I'm trying to generate a decision tree from that model, okay? So I'm pretty much doing the exact same thing. Uh, I think let's cut it short and show you the end result. So this is a final, okay. Disclaimer, I do have a token version. So I took the course about for this software and used my license. And I called the, the developer or the main person and he gave me a token version for this talk specifically. So I should thank Lionel Jouffre uh, for his largesse, I think. Okay. So the, what, what this decision tree tells me once I have the data is the level of expression of each and every gene, okay? So if the expression is inferior or equal to 567, which is the value that the, the DNA microarray test gives you, the diagnosis is most likely with a 92% confidence in AML, okay? And if it's above that threshold, the diagnosis is an ALL with a 94% confidence, okay? So again, because this is a token version, I don't have the full potential of the software. Um, in the original uh, data set, we narrowed down the genes to six, and the confidence was 99.1%. Okay, so that's in a nutshell. Yes. I wonder if the software uses sigmoid functions. Sigmoid functions? It's, it's a, yes. Well, it's a function that outputs one or zero. If it's a lower than some, some number mm. and a higher than some number, I wonder if it's the same. That's a good question for Lionel, who developed the software, but I can't really, yeah. It, it uses probabilities. I don't know if that answers your question, though. Um, we don't really deal with binary data. Well, it's the decision was, well, the, the one and zero. Oh, from, from the response variable. From the data. Yeah. It puts weights in the data and then yeah. computes, and then the output sometimes becomes one. Yeah. Either one or zero. It depends on the weights that you put in the data. So. Is that true? Relative to the regression trees that I just showed? Uh, regression, regression, regression is more like prediction, so mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, disclaimer, I'm a user, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know the, in, I know how to use it, but the. No, it's amazing because you're able to play with the data and come up with a super 
Yeah. Yeah. It's not a whole lot of uh, out there on it, on it, so. Yeah, it's fairly new. It's kind of inspired from quantum physics, actually, where it deals with things as not a continuous variable. It's everything is a probability, so even concentrations of genes expression or whatnot can be a probability. Mm -hmm. So are you guys, uh, how close are you guys to having live use of your software procedure? Okay. Uh, this. This is being used already in France, in all of their hospitals, uh, for the diagnostic of this, this disease specifically. So this is already being used. It's just uh, a case study, okay? So in, in, in our case at Rocky Mountain Analytical, we have, we're developing a panel of steroids, uh, ranging from estrogens, androgens. So estrogens are the female hormones that are high in females. They're also present in males. Androgens are the male hormone that are higher in males than Females, uh, progestins are ex more female hormones, uh, and they have different meanings depending on the cycle. Uh, and corticoids can be an indicator of stress. Melatonins can be an indicator of your gut uh, health, uh, and also like your sleep pattern. So we're trying to combine all of these uh, compounds to provide uh, a um, uh, comprehensive uh, outlook on uh, patients' health. Uh, so far, the way we were, do, uh, or the way, the way it was conducted so far in the industry is from the ref range, so from Canadian population from coast to coast to coast, determining the range and where the person falls within that range. Okay, so if it's, we conduct initially a reference range that is supposed to capture the Canadian population. And if the person is within the 95% confidence interval, then they are deemed to be normal. If they are away from that uh, confidence interval, then we need to look what's happening out there. Um, that's not very efficient and not very comprehensive. Uh, so the way we look at reference ranges need to be rethought. And if you have any ideas, please, by all means, <laughs> let me know. because. We haven't had those reference ranges yet, but we'll be doing them probably next week. And once I have all the data, I was thinking of using this approach, but I'm open to any other approach if uh, anyone can share that with me. That's a great place to stop.